All right, welcome to this LF Energy webinar on unveiling Open EE Meter 4.0. We're joined today with some great subject matter experts from Recurve who will be walking you all through the content of this webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, you will see a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface, which you can use to submit questions. We will be addressing as many questions as possible during the event via um, text response. So keep an eye on there for responses to your questions. If we have time at the end, we will also answer some questions verbally. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Adam Shear of Recurve to make introductions and kick us off. Great, thank you so much, Dan, and thanks to Linux Foundation Energy for hosting us today and for being a huge supporter of the OpenEE Meter and everything we're gonna talk about. Um, and I wanna say thanks also to the working group that uh, we've been facilitating for the last year or so that has ultimately wound up at this point where we have something to share with the broader community. Um, and today you're going to hear from Travis Sykes, who has been the lead developer of OpenEE Meter 4.0, as well as Jason Chulock, who has been a key engineer on the project and has made enormous improvements to the repository that should make this whole project much more readily accessible by any prospective user. So we can go to the next slide, Travis. You know, as with anything um, LF Energy, uh, we got to be aware of the antitrust policy. I'm not going to read all this today, um, but just be aware that, hey, you know, we're developing all of this under applicable U.S. state, federal antitrust competition laws. Um, and so something to be aware of. And, you know, if you need to read any more on this topic, you there's a, a link in the slide that we can send along later. OK, we can go to the next slide. So what are we going to go go through today in roughly an hour? Uh, first, we're going to talk about purpose and brief history of the open EE meter. Just what is it and why? Then we're going to undertake a quick methods review uh, and then talk about some of the issues that we're addressing in the newest version of this code base, the Open EE Meter 4.0, along with key results that give us an indication of how well we've succeeded in solving some of the problems with the pre-existing methods that are, are kind of our starting point. Then we're going to talk about the how, you know, how do we actually get there? How do we improve the accuracy? How do we improve the speed? of the methods themselves. And then finally, uh, I mentioned Jason has led a massive overhaul of the API and the repository itself to make all of this effort, you know, that much more readily accessible by anybody who is a prospective user. So we can go to the next slide. So let's talk about just what is the open meter? Why does it exist in a brief history? Well, first and foremost, the open meter is meant to take an industry that has typically been uh, kind of evaluated with professional judgment, for lack of a better phrase. So when a demand side program is run, oftentimes the final results, the final sort of answer on how much energy did we save, when did we save it, where did we save it, um, is up to an evaluation that is done sometimes years after a program, and it's done with a bespoke set of methods that was developed by a specific evaluator for that specific program at that point in time. And well, there are very many smart people who've been involved on the evaluation side, and they all have the best intentions, that formula is not a recipe to get us to scale. It's not a recipe to get us to settlement quality measurement that we can use in a procurement. It's not a recipe to help us compete against supply side resources. For that, we really need something that is open and transparent and is replicable. So that's where the open EE meter really comes in. We say, look, if you want to make measurements of demand side programs, you want to do it fast and you want to do it in a way that people have confidence in and can scale in a procurement space, then you need open source and you need replicability. And you need subject matter experts who are not coming from just one evaluation firm, but are coming from across the industry. So we can click forward, Travis. So again, enabling our industry to, to compete at scale. And finally, uh, one of the big thrusts behind the open EE meter is to take measurement out of something that's specific and designed exclusively for 
energy efficiency or demand response or solar PV or electric vehicles, and ultimately combine those uh, types of approaches into one holistic measurement that can be made for any kind of virtual power plant. Because ultimately, we need programs to take advantage of all the technologies that are available to us, not just one. Okay, Travis, let's move forward. Uh, suffice to say, this is the work over many years from many organizations. Recurve is just one of them, and we're happy to sort of be leading this conversation today. But everybody you see here has played a hand all the way from Open e meter 1.0 to where we are now and further development that's continually happening in, happening in the working group. The Open e meter itself got started all the way back in 2012. So we're more than a decade into this effort. And back then it was called the CalTrack methods. They were initially developed in order to help calibrate software tools for building energy consumption. So you'd say, look, we have a project that's taking place in a residential building, and we believe it's going to save this much energy based on a software tool that would take into account building airflows and square footage and all sorts of parameters about the specific building. But nobody really knew, hey, is the software actually aligning with the results that we would observe by making a real measurement with AMI data or, or, or smart meter data? So the Caltrack methods were developed in order to help calibrate these building models. And then since then, the project's really taken off as much more of an independent uh, measurement tool in order to create baselines and savings measurements for all sorts of buildings, for all sorts of projects on the demand side. And ultimately in 2019, uh, the Open E-Meter joined the Linux Foundation Energy as an open source project. And here we are in 2024, releasing the latest version of the software. So this project has a long history and we're hoping to you know, keep it going. And I wanna thank everybody that's been involved again in the most recent working group because you've gotten us to this point where we've really breathed some new life into a project that um, you know, had gone a little stale, frankly. Okay, we can keep moving. Okay, so again, why? The, the why of what we're doing. You know, the energy industry is changing fast. The utility industry is changing fast. The demand side program industry is changing fast. And Travis, just go ahead and click forward. You know, you see examples of this all over the place. Electric vehicles, electric, you know, space heating and water heating, solar plus storage. Um, there are all sorts of new technologies that are being brought to bear on grid reliability, on climate change. And I've been in this industry now about 10 years. The biggest single change that I've observed is the electric grid itself is becoming the hub for decarbonization, not just electric power plant decarbonization, but also transportation decarbonization, building decarbonization. And as such, you have all of these technologies that are impacting the grid at the same time. We need methods that are able to capture those effects accurately. All right, we can move on. So quick review of methods and the issues that we're trying to address here. First and foremost, um, you know, you can imagine a building's energy consumption over time and you just have some sort of shape to that energy consumption. Maybe the building is using more in the evening. They're using a little less in the middle of the night, but a program comes along and we say, okay, now we're going to purposefully change the way that that building is using energy. Maybe this is a smart thermostat and you try to shift people's energy consumption away from peak more toward the middle of the day when the grid is cleaner, or maybe it's an air conditioning replacement program or insulation uh, program, you know, or a demand response program, whatever it may be. So you have a baseline period that consists of the time before the program, then you have the program happening itself, the intervention, and then after that program, the, the building's energy consumption has changed, but that has changed in a way that you have to measure. And so the open e-meter is all about how do you actually measure this? And the way you do that is by creating a model of how the building is using energy in the pre-intervention period, that baseline period. And then you project that model forward as what's called a counterfactual. It's a prediction of what the energy consumption in the building would have been in the absence of the program. And then you compare that counterfactual to the amount of energy that was actually used at any given time from that building and the difference between that counterfactual 
uh, and the actual observed consumption after the program is what you attribute to the program as load impact or as savings. So that's the way we're using the open e-meter model. Now, today we're specifically talking about what's called the daily model. The daily model is exactly like it sounds. You take every day uh, in a year and you take the consumption that was observed on that day and you build a model based on what you're seeing. So what we're showing here is a single meter and every data point is the amount of gas consumption, therms, that was used on every day during the baseline period. So there are 365 points and the x-axis is the average temperature of that day. So you can see that there, when the temperature gets colder, as we move further left on the graph, the building uses more gas. This is pretty typical of a building that has space heating, a furnace. And as you keep going out more past, you know, 65, 70, all the way to 85 degrees, um, the building doesn't tend to use anymore. So this sort of defines the concept of what we call a balance point temperature. Travis, you can click forward just a couple of times. So the balance point temperature is where the model locates the best way to split these data into a temperature independent region uh, where you can increase the temperature or decrease the temperature, but you're not gonna actually change the model's prediction of how much energy is being used. And a linear increasing region as we go from uh, warmer temperatures to colder temperatures. And that linear region is basically saying, how much more gas are we using when the temperature goes from 60 degrees to 55 or 50? How much heating are we using? And the space where we transition from that temperature independent region to the linearly increasing region is called the balance point temperature. In this case, it's about 63 degrees. So this is the current model. This is the model that we're starting with. So we've addressed three main issues in this model that we're going to get to, and Travis is going to lead the discussion here. Um, first is seasonal bias. The second is weekend weekday bias. And the third is computational efficiency. So we can go ahead and move forward and I'll talk about what each of these things are very briefly. So when we're talking about seasonal bias, what do we mean by that? We basically mean that if you imagine a day 60 degrees in the summertime and a day that's 60 degrees in the wintertime, you actually have most buildings use energy differently on those two days, even though the temperature is the same. And effectively that's coming from the fact that people start heating their homes at a warmer temperature in the winter than in the summer. If it's 60 degrees in the summer, they tend not to heat their homes. Whereas if it's 60 degrees in the winter, they do tend to heat their homes. And because of this effect, you get something called seasonal bias. So what we're showing here is the existing open e meter model before we've made the changes that we're gonna talk about today and the distribution of seasonal bias. So this is a sample of about 6,000 or 10,000 meters and this is a, a sample of gas customers. And you can see that the model's prediction is systematically too low in the winter. So the, av the, the average customer, the model is under predicting consumption by about 17 therms. This is all residential customers. Meanwhile, if we look at the summer, the effect is exactly the opposite. So the model is actually over predicting consumption in the summer. So you have this systematic error that exists in the model. And so the model is what we call underspecified. This is an underspecified model. Uh, we actually need to add a little bit more complexity to the model in order to get the model into the sweet spot of where it's doing an accurate job of predicting across all the seasons of the year. Okay, next slide. This is where we landed. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to bury the lead here. I'm going to step on Travis's toes and I'm just going to tell you, this is where we landed. This, this is the open e-meter 3.0 versus 4.0. The top graph being 3.0, and that's that same distribution of winter bias that I just showed you. And the bottom graph is 4.0, and it's where we've landed. You can see the distribution is much narrower around zero, which is where we'd like it to be and that the systematic bias has been dramatically reduced. Great. Now the next slide is gonna show, uh, I think we maybe missed one, Travis, can we go back? 
Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, I must have just left a slide out. So the next slide is going to show an individual meter example. Um, and so the bottom graph of the left-hand plot is showing us the Caltrack, I'm sorry, the Open e meter 3.0 model that was developed. And that's just taking all those 365 days, looking for that balance point temperature and fitting those two regions of the graph that I talked about earlier. And if you look at this graph carefully enough, that bottom panel, the winter data points are shown in blue triangles. And you can see that the model, which is the line, is systematically too low. You can see that most of those winter data points are above the line. Meanwhile, most of the summer data points shown in red, they're the red uh, diamonds, are, are lower than the line. So this is an individual meter example. This is how seasonal bias arises. So this model is fitting the data as best it can, but it's unaware of the season. And because of that, you get these error profiles that are shown on the top graph, where we're just looking at the cumulative error as we go from low temperature to high temperature. And you can see the winter shown in blue ends up with you know, very uh, negative error, meaning the model is under predicting. And in the summer and in the shoulder periods, the model is over predicting, leading to positive systematic bias. Now, the open e meter 4.0, by contrast, is shown on the right for this very same set of data. And now you can see a couple things. One, the bias profiles on the top, those cumulative error profiles, are much closer to zero, which is, which is where we need them to be. And in the bottom graph, you can see why. So the model has been split into a winter model independently, shown in blue, and then a combination of summer and shoulder periods together that yield the green and red curve. And that's the combined model uh, that is a singular model for the summer and shoulder periods. You can also see that that combined model for summer and shoulder is has a region that is curved. So it's not purely linear. So you can see we've added a lot. You know, we have an independent winter model and a summer shoulder model that's, that is nonlinear. And how did the model decide to take this formulation instead of, for example, fitting the summer period independently of the shoulder and winter period? That's, that's really where the beauty of the development that's taken place is this model has been formulated based on the way the data needed the model to be in order to eliminate a lot of bias across this meter during the seasons. So if we go to the next slide, it's an example of weekend weekday bias. So in this case, we have a meter where the black circles on the left, this is the open e meter 3.0 model again, the black circles are the weekdays and the olive sort of yellowish color uh, diamonds are the weekends. And again, the model is just taking these 365 data points and trying to split the difference. Um, but now we allow the model to be aware of weekends and weekdays, and you get the right-hand graph in open e-meter 4.0, where clearly this building is using energy very differently on the weekdays versus the weekends, and we allow the model to split along weekends and weekdays because of that. So now again, the question is, in this case, the model is not splitting by season, and it's only splitting by weekday weekend. It could also split by season, so how does the model know to do that? And with that, I will pass the baton to Travis and he's gonna tell us how. Um, oh, another one more thing, I'm sorry. Also, <laughs> apologies, we've sped up the model. So previously we were looking at 20 to 60 seconds per meter, which is very computationally expensive. And if you're trying to run this on large data sets, it can become uh, very expensive, both computationally as well as dollars. We've sped this model up by about a factor of 100. So now we have a much faster model. And Travis will also talk about how we got there. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I, first, I'm going to be discussing how we arrived at the accuracy, much of which uh, Adam has already alluded to. But to break this down uh, to, to its simplest components, let's talk about uh, the seasonal bias. 
So here on the y-axis, I have energy usage, and on the x-axis, temperature. Imagine for a moment that you have different behavior in winter here in purple, uh, green, where we, is the shoulder months, which is the combination of uh, spring and fall because they kind of act similar to each other, as well as the summer months. Now, the previous model would simply try to cut through the middle of all of that, which means that it would underpredict winter, overpredict shoulder, and underpredict summer. Our solution to this is that we just allow the model to split and create unique models for each of these seasons. Again, we'll talk about how it chooses to do this uh, a little bit later. Now, Again, we have the same issue with weekday weekend bias, uh, where at the top here I show weekday and at the bottom weekend. This is most common as weekend usage for like a, a commercial building is going to decrease significantly compared to its weekday usage. If like it's an office building and people everybody's going home. Um, but what the previous model would try to do would be to split the difference. And again, we allow it to create its own unique model for the weekday and the weekend. Uh, another problem is that previously this was a um, piecewise linear uh, function where it was just a combination of linear functions and there was no room for any kind of smoothing in between in the event that let's say you have a water heater in your house and the temperature coming in is slowly decreasing as you go from uh, uh, the fall to the to the winter and so your water heater is having to try a little bit harder but not it's not a step change it's just incrementally uh, you might see something more like this where it's a smoothed transition as opposed to the sharp transition of like uh, shoulder to summer where suddenly your ac kicks on and then from then on it's just going to be a linear increase we have also added a feature where this gets into the purpose of these models. And the purpose of these models is not to predict uh, the baseline year exactly. The purpose of these models is to try to project the baseline year into the future and then based on the actual temperature and conditions of, the, of this future year, which at the time you run this would be in the past. But we do not know how the house would or the meter would respond. And sometimes you end up with very large outliers, such as I'm showing here, where perhaps their, their electricity just turned off. Uh, they were doing construction or something. Well, currently the model would try to, again, split the difference and these outliers would be highly influential and pull the entire fit down. This means that you're no longer going to be predicting the general behavior of the house. So instead, we use an adaptive robust loss function to downweight outliers. I'm gonna to jump to the left here where this is the loss response and this is the number of standard deviations from the mean. So most people are going to be familiar with sum of squared errors, which is this black line right here. And you can see that if there are few, um, if there's few outliers, and meaning everything is centralized around negative one to positive one, number of standard deviations from the mean, then this would be the ideal uh, loss function to pick because it allows all of those to, it is the, the also the lowest uh, loss function that you can have. Now, as you start having more and more outliers, if you were to have a point over at uh, three or four standard deviations from the mean, then it's going to be a very large value. Whereas with these other loss functions, as you start increasing this alpha parameter, which is how it decides the shape, then they, they become less and less influential until it uh, bottoms out at the Welsh function. And the whole purpose of this is to optimally pick alpha for the data set that you have. So this is done for each individual meter. Uh, it chooses which alpha it should pick based on the data, which results in it, for this, for example, this um, meter right here, it would choose something more like a Welsh as opposed to a sum of squared errors, where it can then downweight these and the resulting um, uh, regression will be much closer to the general behavior of summer. Now let's talk a little bit about how we made this faster. 
previously, the way that uh, we would decide where to put balance points was done using a grid search. And just to really emphasize how we gained this speed, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is the difference between a grid search and an optimization. So here on the right, I show a, a surface response plot. And imagine that we are trying to get to the peak right up here. Well, if we are doing that with a grid search, that means we're going to drop points uh, in a in a very standard pattern, such as uh, just a a lin space or or something of that nature, and evaluate each of these. And then you're going to have to try to find the next best place, which means that you're going to have to segment these again and again and again until you get the correct answer, or as close to the correct answer as you want to be. Now with an optimization, uh, you just drop these points where you want, and then each point is actually influencing where the next point is dropped at. So if the, if we, on the response curve uh, it's very low, then it's going to want to be it's going to try a different spot until eventually it's going to find one that is slightly higher, and all of the points are going to be dropped within this area and, and congregate. Now. If you wanted to reach the same level of accuracy, which I've shown here. So with optimization, we are at almost the peak with nine evaluations. Whereas with a grid search to reach that, we're still not there with 25 evaluations. You could improve the way that uh, the grid, of, grid search works, but at that point, you're doing an optimization. You're no longer really doing a grid search. So basically, we have opted to use the optimization as opposed to the grid search just to give you an idea of how many models this actually means. So with the previous version, this, this meant that we had to create 1,891 models um, frequently in order to find the best case. Whereas now we find about one and a half. And I say a half because there is a, a preliminary step that I'm about to discuss. So that optimization, the way that it actually implemented is we are trying to find the balance points. And this is the same kind of plots that we were showing before where it's usage over and uh, on Y and temperature on X. And here we start with the balance point at the 10% and 90% of the data. And then we use a, it's called a direct method. It's a global op optimization method in order to try to optimize where these two balance points are. For those of you that are familiar with uh, trying to fit piecewise linear functions, you know that trying to fit where those breakpoints are is a massive headache. And so this global optimization method is a necessity. We cannot use a gradient descent method. But in short, this has helped to speed things up massively. Another thing that we've done, previously we would have to fit a whole bunch of different model potential models like what happens if we don't include a uh, slope on either the cooling degree days or the heating degree days and we would have to fit all of all of the different possible permutations instead of doing that we'd use something called an elastic net and in an elastic net uh, or actually before i get to the elastic net let me explain in ordinarily squares in ordinarily squares its purpose is simply to minimize uh the residuals typically through a sum of squared errors. Whereas with an elastic net, its purpose is it wants to minimize residuals plus the coefficients, which means if this is a, is a characterization of what we might be seeing, then we as people would identify the black line as being optimal. But the computer might actually say that, well, if we don't consider uh, minimizing coefficients, uh, then this red line might actually be optimal. Well, if we put the coefficients in there as something to also be minimized, that means that it is effectively pushing that slope downward, which is going to push it towards the black line, which is what we want. We want the simplest model that explains the complexity of the data that we're seeing. This is a characterization. The way that it's really working is here I'm showing a pretty normal example of data that we might have with both uh, heating degrees, uh, degree days, and cooling degree days. The two balance points, uh, which I have labeled as balance point cooling and balance point heating. Here, what we're trying to do 
is we are trying to both, or not both, we are trying to push this slope towards zero, both for the cooling degree days and the heating degree days. We are trying to push this intercept towards zero. We are also trying to push these balance points together, because if we have one balance point, that is a simpler model than having two balance points. At the same time, we are also trying to push these balance points towards the edge of the data. Because if it's going towards the edge of the data, then you can imagine that in, a, in some world, that means that we just have a linear model. Now we're trying to do that with both of the balance points. You put all of this together and what you end up with is you can start off with the most complex model, but through this optimization using the elastic net, we are actually getting the simplest model that we can to describe the complexity of the, da of the data. Now then, how do we know when to split? Getting back to the, the crux of the matter of, of the real difficulty in this. So we are trying to minimize this testing error. Uh, so here I've got error in, uh, on Y and model complexity on X. Now with training error, we can add more and more and more variables, but it doesn't help at a certain point because yes, you can decrease your training error, which is the, the data that you're training your model on. But then when you run that model, your testing error starts to increase. What does that look like? Well, on the left side, for an underfit model, uh, this is this would be analogous to what we currently have, where we have no splitting. By the way, basically you can we if we're looking at this, we're saying okay, this this looks kind of like a parabola, uh, but if it's an underfit model, maybe we don't allow uh, it to have that kind of structure, and so it's just a linear model. Then it's going to cut right through the data, which means that we are not going to be capturing what we want. On the other side, we at this point. Now we're beyond capturing the the uh, the behavior of the model, and now we're starting to actually model the variance within that. Um, and this means that we're not when you actually run the model, you're again not capturing the beh behavior because you're capturing the behavior plus you're capturing uh, the variance. And this would be analogous to if we used all possible splits all of the time. Instead, where we want to be is this optimally fit, where we are splitting through the data, but in an intelligent way so that we're not capturing every bit of variance. Now, how do we get there? Well, first we need to talk about test and train. Um, it would be fantastic if we could just say, we're going to make our test data the baseline period, and we're going to make our train data the reporting period. But without a lot of extra data, this is difficult to do. And it would also be nice if we could just base all of that on the baseline period. Well, we can do that. And we can do that because for these for these tools, um, and this model specifically, we're not taking into consideration any temporal components, which means that we can basically ignore that within our test train. And then we can do a stratified uh, K-fold sampling within our baseline period. What does that mean? For those of you that are unfamiliar, cross-validation and uh, test train splits often go something like this, where you have your original data, and here they're colored in red, green, and blue. So for round one, you would take the red and the green, and you would train your model on this data, and it would never see the blue data. Instead, it uses this blue data as the test data. And then you run the model on the test data and find out what is the error that you see. But what happens if there's something weird about the data in either the blue or the combination of the green and, and uh, red? Well, that's why we do a k-fold, which means a basically a 1 to 3, 1 to 5. We have a bunch of different possible combinations. Here, we would split this into red and blue and then have the test data as green. And then we can make, then we're you're doing the same model, but we're able to do have a different train and a different test to find out what is the test. Imagine we continue this. Then we average all of that, both for the train and the test. And from there, we're able to estimate what our 
test error would be, which is how does this actually work as a prediction? Why do we want to do this? Uh, well, we want the best model parameters and we want to only use it within the baseline period so that w when we're doing this, we can end up having predictive modeling. Unfortunately, all of that is fantastic and it works. It's It's been proven to work. It's been something that's been used for many decades now, but it's too slow to use on a million buildings. Instead, we are using cross-validation in development. Um, then we are going to try to approximate the cross-validation validation using a selection criterion. This is where we, again, take the sum of squared errors and we add some penalty, kind of similar to the elastic net, but a different penalty. The problem with this is that cross is that the selection criterion that you're probably most familiar with uh, AIC, BIC, they are meant to reduce a master model. They are not meant for splitting data like we are describing here. And again, a way that I like to talk about all of this is a balancing of accuracy, which is going to be costly in time, versus cost, which is going to be how long it takes your computer to run, how much are you having to pay to run the computer for that long. And we can use all of this together in order to get a uh, very fast but pretty accurate model. Now, to do all of that, we ran a whole bunch of uh, test examples, 6,000 uh, different meters, 4,000 of those being residential gas, 1,000 being residential electric, and 1,000 being commercial electric. With these, we were able to test different uh, different selection criterion, different variables within that selection criterion in order to modify. And in this example, we did a Bayesian information criterion, BIC, and we modified that with some parameters. And we optimized those parameters based on our um, our cross-validation, and which in this case was a tenfold cross-validation using RMSE. And then we were able to optimize those variables so that then all we had to do in the future was simply use those variables as they were optimized, and then the model could be run very, very fast, as we showed before. Now, earlier, uh, Adam showed a couple of examples. This one happens to be my favorite that we found during testing. And the reason why is this example shows everything. Here on the left is open e meter 3.0, and you can see all the different splits between winter, uh, weekend, winter, weekday, summer, uh, and shoulder. And you can see the error rising for and decreasing, and you can you can imagine exactly how it's fit for a year because all of this is going to balance out over the course of the year. But for any individual segment of these, it's bad. And you can also visualize that with exactly how it's doing that. Where again, when I described how it's splitting through all of the data, that is quite literally exactly what it is doing. Now, with the new model optimally picks the splits that it should use. And I described earlier uh, how we're attaining computational efficiency. We actually are doing even more than that, but it, I figured it's it's a little too in the weeds, but there is more that we're doing to make it so that there, we are running less and less of these. Um, here, you can see how these break down and how, why it shows what it shows. Well, here are the, week, uh, the weekends, which are usually quite low. And you can see why that would be separate a separate model from the others. Here, you can see the shoulder and the summer and how these two are have one behavior, and yet winter has its own unique behavior. So winter is by itself, but you might notice here on the error plot how this increases. And this is because this error plot is based on the baseline year. It is not based on test train, where we're trying to figure out how predictable to this is in the future. So what's happening at these two points is actually that adaptive loss function I described earlier. Here you can see that these it's got points that are quite low right here, right here, which are exactly where these sharp increases in, uh, in error are, which means in the future, you can expect that the meter is going to behave more like this and less like these outliers. All of this was done without any human intervention, we did not tell it how to split. It figures all of that out on its own, and this is what we get. 
So in some cases, you might end up with a model where it only where it does not have any splits. And in some cases, you might have where it, you've got six different splits for winter weekday, winter weekday, uh, weekend, and so forth. Now, there are a lot more results that we unfortunately do not have the time to go over during this presentation. We highlighted the, the, the big ticket items and just to give you an idea of how everything's working, if you want to dig in a little further, then you can uh, Google open EE meter or look at this um, at this, this slide deck at the end of the slides or at the end of this presentation. Um, it will be up on the same location as the uh, as the meeting was. And you can click the specifications and results and you can go to this document which contains all of the specification and results, which include a lot more results and uh, details on how the different coefficients and so forth actually, like what they actually are. With all of that said, I am now going to pass this off to Jason uh, to talk about the API improvements that we've also made during this same release. Yeah, so when we first began to integrate the new daily model into the library, it was pretty clear that this was going to be a breaking change uh, regardless, primarily based on how the previous model uh, took input with bin temperatures and a set of fixed breaking points that it would do that search over. So we figured that while we were at this, we would try to rethink the API more generally and improve it for the future. Um, next slide. So rather than reinventing the wheel, we took inspiration from Scikit-Learn, which is a fairly popular uh, data science library in Python that has, um, I believe, over 100 models, maybe 200 models that all follow a very similar interface, a very similar calling pattern, where first you initialize a model with any configuration that's specific to that model. You fit on your train data, in our case, baseline data, and then you predict on your new observations, our reporting year. So we figured that if Scikit can incorporate all of these different models, this big variety of models into a similar interface, we should be able to do the same with uh, approximately three models. So that's what we were kind of aiming for. If you go to the next slide. Now for some context on the previous version, after discussing with users as well as examining our own internal usage of the library, we found that most people were essentially copying from the documentation because, um, well, for a couple of reasons, really. One is that the, the way that you fit and predicted on the daily and hourly models was different between the two. And especially for the hourly model, the actual code was fairly sizable. So it was like, it was not trivial to internalize that yourself if you're only writing it once. So um, one kind of aspect of this was there was a lot of intermediate results that were kept or just discarded more often. And a lot of manual scaffolding that had to be built by the user. So for 4.0, what we've done is we've unified the calls to the daily billing and hourly uh, methods. And this makes it a lot simpler to process what's actually going on, or rather it abstracts the internals of the models from the user. So you just need to know that you're creating a model, fitting it, and then predicting. Uh, we've also created defaults for both the daily and the billing models so that you don't need to know anything about the internals. You just need to know what type of data you are fitting and predicting on. And any intermediate information that would be useful we'd like to incorporate into both data, the data classes and the models so that it's tracked by default and you don't need to have your own separate processes to keep track of it. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So the following two slides are uh, pretty text heavy, but rather than trying to sort of parse through the whole thing, it's more just to convey like a visual sense of the change. The left-hand side is the previous version, the right hand is the new version. And the top is the daily methods, the bottom is billing. Previously, the distinction between daily and billing was made through a couple parameters. We were exposing to the user that you were still using a daily model. And the only way to distinguish was to set billing presets to true and to set the weights column to end days kept, which is a little bit um, 
non-obvious other than by essentially copying the documentation as previously mentioned. So on the right hand, we are showing a much simpler interface where you're just passing your data to specific data classes for each method where it will do any aggregations for you, um, such as from hourly meter data to daily or from uh, billing to daily. And then uh, the fit and predict will be the same for any methods. You can go to the next slide. So the hourly method, the difference here is a bit more um, visually ob obvious, but, uh, and there are comments on the left-hand side. This isn't you know, an exact line by line count, but the primary thing of note here is that this is about seven different function calls with a bunch of different intermediate design matrices and intermediate information that most users did not use. And if they were to use it, they'd have to track it separately. So right now we've provided a wrapper to what uh, the same internals of the model, but with this new unified interface so that once we do update that hourly model, there won't be a breaking change. You can just start using, uh, you can just use that same code. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so as previously mentioned, there were, we created a couple new data classes. So going into this, the goals for the data classes are, there's a few goals. One is to help ensure that the default path when using Open EE Meter is a compliant savings measurement. So in the past, there are, most of what we've used here was previously implemented, but you had to know to use it and you had to know how to handle that information throughout the process. And it was potentially fragile or error prone. And one reason for that is there are different requirements for different data types or for different uh, levels of granularity for your data. So if you have hourly meter data, daily meter data, or billing data, those are all fairly different and require different thresholds to determine whether they'll be sufficient to fit a model and to pre predict on it. So what we do here is any aggregations that are required, we run them for you. And then we'll check all of those uh, sufficiency requirements and keep track of them inside of the data class. And then they'll be propagated to the model once, once it's fit. By default, the model will throw an exception if you're trying to fit or predict on data that is deemed insufficient by these guidelines. But we're definitely allowing you to bypass that for research or experimentation. And yeah, that's most of what we were trying to accomplish here was just giving a good default path, but still allowing for uh, some flexibility if your use case required it. And yeah, I, I guess so in conclusion, the, the main changes here are unifying the API between all the different methods and then supplying new data classes that allow users to get their data issues tracked by default without requiring any other intervention, and then helping to ensure that you're getting a compliant savings measurement by default. Thank you, Jason. So let's uh, also wrap up everything. So in conclusion, I'd say mission accomplished as the goal was to reduce seasonal bias. We've done that by 84%. In addition to that, we identified weekday weekend bias and reduced that by 95%. Uh, despite all of those gains, uh, you would expect a, a model that takes longer. But in fact, the daily model is two to 10 times faster. Um, this is because the daily model takes into consideration all of those possible splits, whereas the billing model only takes, in, it does not do any splitting. And in that case, it is 100 times faster. Uh, also, due to the the nature of the broad data set that we fit all of these parameters on, uh, the splitting parameters, I mean, uh, they are broadly applicable. If you are interested in using EE Meter, it is currently available to you. You can just do pip install EE Meter. It is up on PyPy. And, or if you want, you can go to our, uh, our GitHub and you can do pull requests and, and whatever you like there. As Jason mentioned, uh, for the API, 
we standardize the calls for all the models so that now we follow this fit predict uh, structure. And for the data class, we format, we format all of the data for the models, we check sufficiency, and we provide disqualification reasons, making this so much easier for both users and developers. We did not do this alone. So I would like to go ahead and uh, thank the technical steering committee, which is uh, Adam, McGee, Phil, uh, myself, uh, as well as Steve, and the key contributors to this release, which were Armin, uh, Jason, Joydi, Ethan, Matt, and James. Uh, the companies involved in this uh, were Recurve, Watt Car uh, Carbon, Resilient Edge, and Carbon Co-op. With all of that said, that sums up everything for 4.0. But just to let you all know, this is the story does not end. We are already working on the next model. Feel free to join the working group, which you can find at uh, caltrack.org, technical working group. We're currently working on the hourly model. And right now, we are getting towards the end stage of that. We're finding that it's 10 times faster. We are seeing huge improvements for solar PV customers. Here's an example of error improvement on Y with uh, the percent daily cloudiness on X. And you can see that... As we are getting cloudier, uh, you, we are seeing larger and larger error improvement. The model is also a lot more flexible. And we are also, it, this, this model is being developed uh, with a native expectation of having a data class. Uh, so this will be a lot nicer than the wrapper that we currently have around the hourly model. With all of that said, uh, we have a little bit of time left over for questions. And um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thanks. I'll just open it up for questions here. And um, if anybody has any, uh, feel free to speak up. Or, or Dan, I don't know if people have to submit them through Q&A. Um, yes, they do need to submit them through the Q&A. But um, there are four pending in there right now. Great. Dan, do you want to read them out or shall we read them out and answer? So the first one, I can do that. The first one is a follow-up um, that you had responded to in text, Adam. The original was on the water heater case with nonlinear shoulder. Is there a way that you think about the information contained in the parameters that go into that spline, similar to how we can think about units HTD reflecting underlying home equipment efficiencies? And Adam, you had asked, um, are you asking if we get valuable information from the model parameters that define the curvature? The follow-up to that is, yeah, basically. Another way to put it maybe is, do the additional parameters have information that's as interpretable as the heating and cooling disaggregation that's possible with the linear coefficients? Yeah, so just to summarize that quickly, um, we mainly focused today on the use case of the open EE meter, whereby you're producing a counterfactual. In other words, a prediction of how much energy would have been used in the absence of a program. And then you're using that counterfactual in order to measure savings. Um, having said that, there is another use case of a lot of this work, which is to actually disaggregate building load into heating and cooling and temperature independent consumption. And so the question is acknowledging that and is basically also asking then, is there anything useful that we can get out of the model parameters that not only define those heating and cooling loads, but the ones that are a little bit more subtle in the sense that they're defining the curvature uh, that you might see between seasons, for example. Um, you know, Travis talked about the fact these are not just purely linear models and you gave the water heating example. Travis, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I haven't thought about that a lot, actually. It's a good question. Um, so the way that that variable is set up uh, is a little bit messy. Um, like the way that it's it's done in the code is uh, basically a zero to 100% uh, as far as here's the maximum amount of smoothing you could have because at some point you'll reach the edge of your data. Um, could you gain some sort of insight from that? I'm going to say possibly. Uh, it's honestly something like Adam just said that we had not even uh, considered. Uh, I would like to add on to what Adam said, though. 
and uh, it's I feel that this question is really important. Something that was not mentioned in this presentation is that one of the critical criteria for the improvement of this model was that we keep a structure in it so that we could do heating and cooling disaggregation, which is why this led us directly to the splitting and not going the direction of uh, a more generic um, machine learning methodology. Okay, great. Um, so uh, the next one, it's actually two questions from the same person and they look related. So I'll read them all at once. Um, the question starts with, is all of the data from the same climate zone slash seasons, if you use the model in a different climate zone, does it resplit? And is the splitting done per meter or for a set of meters? And then the next part was, how does it work in climate zones where there might be no cooling in summer or the seasons are completely different? So the way that this is set up in the code, um, like... We say summer, shoulder, winter, but honestly, those are just arbitrary uh, names. And so it doesn't matter what they're called. You could be in the Southern Hemisphere and they'll be switched. It'll be the wrong seasons, but you can just figure that out pretty easily. We, I think we might also have some flexibility in what you call those. I can't remember if it made it into the final version. Um, as far as if there is no cooling, um, there are plenty of models like that. Uh, so during our testing set, we did, I think I said 4,000 of those meters were gas data and gas data has no cooling typically. Uh, so for those, the models that it produced were basically uh, a temperature independent region and a heating uh, sensitive area. This would happen for all of the models that you put in. So the seasons doesn't matter. Sometimes it'll try to push everything towards uh, being a flat line. So if your model can be described as t entirely temperature independent, that is what you will get. As far as the climate zone, um, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, this was not designed for a specific climate zone. It was it, The fitting was done purely on should it split or not, which is completely independent of the climate zone. Uh, so this should be entirely viable in the UK, Australia, uh, pick your country and this should work. If it does not work, then all we have to do to fix that is to get data that we can train, we redo all of that training on, add that in, and then we can refit those coefficients to match. I really, really do not expect that to be the case. And I think that this is going to be uh, globally applicable. And the splitting is all of this, These this model is designed to be done on a per meter basis, not on a set of meters, though there is nothing stopping you from averaging meters together and then putting that in to be modeled. Um, it, uh, that is not the intended purpose, but there's nothing stopping you from playing with your data and using these models however you like. It's just, I'm not sure you could really say that the results of that would be open EE meter compliant. One thing I wanted to add, uh, Travis here, I don't think it will change anything because the pattern would be the same. And then we're basically using temperature minus balance points. So the balance points should be changed, but the whole pattern would be the same. So I don't expect any changes in any uh, climate zones as well. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, there's two more questions. Um, first one says, great progress team. Would it be possible to add weights to the baseline data set? So the most recent timestamps have bigger impacts on the regression. I'll chime in and say, uh, I'm sure it's possible to do that, although I would not suggest doing that. Reason being, you might say the most recent data are the most relevant because it's capturing, you know, how the building is using energy, um, you know, in, in the most recent way, and therefore it's more representative of how you'd expect the building to use energy going forward. The issue there is one of seasonality. So the most recent month may be December or February or whatever it is. Another meter, it might be June or July. And one of the things you're trying to capture here is the way that air conditioning is used, the way that heating is used. 
And if you're overweighting uh, the months of June or July, for example, um, versus January or February, you're going to overemphasize um, the way that the building is using energy specifically during one season of the year, which you would expect uh, to be very different than um, another season of the year. I would agree with everything that Adam just said as far as being very cautious about that. Um, from a R&D's perspective, again, please note that there's a big difference between what I am talking about in terms of what is compliant with open EE meter that is you can justify for uh, savings measurements um, versus just playing around with a model. And as far as just playing around with a model, at, I know that at one point we did preserve weights going into the going into the um, the function. And so some of the low level, functions may still have that in. I think the most recent updated uh, model class does not allow for weights. So that would require some additional work to re-implement that at the higher level that is more accessible. All right. Um, I think we're over time, um, and that has answered most of the questions. So uh, with that, I will thank all of our panelists for a fantastic presentation and remind everyone that the recording and slides will be available by tomorrow on the same website where you came to join uh, or register. And we will send an email out once that is live, so you don't need to come back and check. You will be notified um, if you want to come and revisit the recording. Thank, Thank you, everyone, so much. Yeah. Thank you very much.